Hello, and welcome back to the Urology Care Podcast, the official podcast of the Urology Care Foundation. Our guest is Dr. Suzette Sutherland, the Director of Female Urology at the University of Washington in Seattle. She joins us to talk about what we should know about our urinary system during the summertime. Are you curious about how much water you should actually be drinking every day? Wondering if that swimming pool or hot tub will increase your risk of a UTI? Do you have an upcoming trip and not sure about how to stick to a good routine? Well, Dr. Sutherland breaks down these questions so you can worry less and enjoy your summer more. So let's get started. Dr. Sutherland, welcome and thank you for joining us on today's podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Can you start by introducing yourself to our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Suzette Sutherland. I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle, Director of Female Urology there. And I specialize in everything female urology, urinary incontinence, pelvic prolapse, bladder dysfunction, neurourology aspects, uh, and such. Uh, I also do some general urology as well. Women that come and want to see a woman and have issues like kidney stones, or they may have hematuria that leads to bladder cancer. Uh, but predominantly what I do is in the area of female pelvic health. Great. Thank you. So Dr. Sutherland, summer is upon us. And that means one thing that people are probably going to be traveling a lot more. And this means plane rides, long car rides, swimming, indulging in a lot of sweet treats, um, you know, just to name a few things. And while the thought of going on a nice long vacation is great, it means that we're not typically in our normal routine. So could you start by giving a basic overview on how travel impacts our urologic systems in general? Well, you uh, hit the nail on the head, really, as far as saying that we're out of our normal routines. Um, And that's the exciting piece piece about being on vacation, right? We are out of our normal routines and we're doing something new and fun and exciting. Uh, But with that, sometimes then we can have some issues if our bodies are used to a certain routine and then we get out of that. So routines like uh, making sure that we're getting enough fluid in during the day Uh, that you're drinking enough fluid to keep your kidneys clear, to keep your bladder clear, to keep things safe, to keep you well hydrated and happy overall. You know, making sure that although we're trying a lot of different foods, sometimes from different cultures, that we want to make sure that we're also not getting constipated or on the other end of the spectrum, getting diarrhea, right? So those things can also affect overall how we feel and certainly how our bladder responds And we want to try to make sure we're getting some regular exercise while we're out and about, whether that just means you're walking about the town and trying to walk a bit more briskly sometimes versus actually getting in a good workout um, once a day, once every other day. But really, whatever routine that you have at home, how much of that routine that you can bring with you while you're traveling um, is really where most people are a bit more successful about not running into trouble either with your bladder, with your bowels, or overall um, with your your body in general. Okay, great. Thank you. That was a, a really great explanation. So kind of going off on that, I want to jump into some common neurologic misconceptions that would be helpful for people to know, especially as we're entering the summertime. So why don't we start with hydration? I know that there is a lot of differing information on how much water we actually need to be drinking. So if you could please help us all out and explain how much water should we actually be drinking every day? Yeah, that's a very good point. So often well-meaning providers tell patients, well, you just need to drink more fluid. You need to drink more fluid. And this provider says it, That provider says it, and the patient hears it repeatedly from all these providers, but doesn't often get any kind of concrete guidelines, parameters by which to follow. And so oftentimes, either the patients still aren't getting enough, or they're uber drinking, right? They're getting so much that it really is complicating 
their bladder issues, especially if they already suffer from some overactive bladder or incontinence issues, and it can compound those problems. So we definitely encourage people to stay well hydrated and drinking on average about two liters of fluid a day is what's generally recommended overall for overall health reasons. But that's two liters of fluid spread out evenly throughout the day. That's not two liters of water on top of everything else that you might want to drink during the day with your meals or otherwise. But we do recommend that about half of that two liters, if it can be water, that's great. Water is very healthy for you, but you also want to drink other things that have some electrolytes in them and maybe some nutritional value as well, like some juice or Gatorade, things like that. Uh, if your urine is a light yellow color, then you're drinking enough. You're doing just fine. So I usually tell patients to go by that rather than measuring everything out all the time. Sometimes it's a good exercise to measure it out once or twice to get an overall feel of what it is that you're doing and get that, how am I going to get the two liters in spread out evenly throughout the day? But after that, measuring all the time, I think, can cause people to focus on it too much and, and be cumbersome. If the urine is a light yellow color, you're really doing fine. If the urine looks that golden color, sort of brownish, yellowish, golden, well, then relatively speaking, the patient's not, or the person's not drinking enough, and they need to increase their volume intake. But if their urine looks like water, they're drinking more than they need. And they're just washing all of that out and they're just uh, eliminating it through the urinary system. Remember, the kidney's job is to help regulate fluid balance from head to toe. So if the kidneys all of a sudden see a large volume load, because someone just guzzled a lot of fluid all at once, the kidneys see that and they say, whoa, this body doesn't need all that right now. I'm not going to absorb that and hold on to it. We're going to get rid of it because it's considered waste at that point, right? And so it just gets eliminated as urine. And so the rate at which the urine is made depends on what the color of the urine looks like. If it's being made very quickly because a lot of fluid is being dumped into the urine, it's going to be very dilute and look like water. So again, if it's a light yellow color, you're doing fine. And it's going to fluctuate throughout the day, depending on what you've just had to drink or eat or so don't be too hard on yourself if it moving around a little, just use it as a guide and say, oh, it looks a little golden right now. I should probably drink a little bit more. And there's no benefit to guzzling, right? Just drink some and then maybe sip throughout the day. I usually tell people drink something with meals and then the rest of that fluid sip in between meals throughout the day, just to get a nice even balance throughout the day. Uh, that's kind of the best way to stay well hydrated and also not have such a huge fluid load to your bladder for those who might have some bladder problems already that I referred to like incontinence or overactive bladder. So those are the general recommendations that we try to instill in patients. Wow. Thank you so much. I hope everyone made note of that. I know I certainly did. Um, that was a lot of really helpful information and it was really easy to understand that the way that you broke it down. So I hope that people take a lot away from that. So the next misconception I want to go into is urinary tract infections or UTIs. You know, the last thing that someone wants to deal with, especially during a summer vacation is a UTI. Is it true that staying in a wet bathing suit can cause a UTI? I've heard that before, but can you touch on um, whether or not that's true? You know, there's no scientific proof to that. So I can't really say yes, that that's going to be a problem. You know, if somebody is in a, a wet bathing suit and they're also exercising and running around and in the same suit all day and it's wet, you know, is there a possible increased risk of having some irritation in that area, in the genital area and vaginal area? And I think that's more predominantly what happens. Or sometimes people who are susceptible to vaginal yeast infections, it can lead to something like that. If you're in moist or wet, whether it's a bathing suit or underwear, Maybe you're having problems with urinary leakage and you're wearing this large wet pad, the same one all day. 
So those are kind of issues that you think about that might cause an increase of colonization of the bacteria there. What we would think of more so is that it might lead to a vaginal yeast infection for people who are maybe a little more susceptible to that uh, as opposed to a true urinary tract infection. Now, oftentimes what happens though is then people can get some local irritating symptoms and it gets confused for, I think I have a urinary tract infection. But if we were to put a catheter into their bladder and get a urine sample, it would most likely show that there really is no infection in the urine or the bladder, but they're just having this irritating symptoms about the vagina, about the external genitalia, and maybe some of that irritation gets translated to the bladder because now the bladder is a little irritated, getting signaling from the outside genitalia, and it makes the woman feel like she has to go to the bathroom more often. And therein lies why they think they have a urinary tract infection. So, you know, I think good hygiene is appropriate, right? So if someone, when we say if they're in a wet bathing suit all day, that's a little hard to imagine because usually if they're then laying in the sun for a while, it dries out. Maybe then they jump back in the pool and it's wet, but they jump in the sun again. And so I don't really see that scenario really leading to a urinary tract infection. The other issue is, um, since you brought that up, is that hot tubs, right? And people, and the same with the swimming pool, right? I can't go in a hot tub because every time I do, I get a urinary tract infection. Well, I would argue that there's so much chlorine in that hot tub to kill whatever ails you <laughs> that mm -hmm. um, it's not something that's going to increase your likelihood of getting a true urinary tract infection. And same with the swimming pool right? If you're in the swimming pool, um, it has chlorine in it. And if you're in the ocean, well, that's just natural salt water. So that's going to be okay too. But I think sometimes, again, people get some local irritating symptoms from being in the hot tub. If they are sensitive, they have skin that's sensitive there and they it gets translated in their mind as a urinary tract infection. There's no absolute basic science to show that hot tubs, wet, you know, bathing suits or any of these kinds of things really do increase one's risk of a recurrent urinary tract infection. While we're on that same topic, I would say, you know, bubble baths, same thing, right? Just even in a bathtub, none of that causes urinary tract infections. If someone, again, has sensitive skin, it might cause some local irritation, but those are individualized issues. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. That's incredibly helpful. So kind of staying in the, the realm of UTIs, does holding your urine cause UTIs? Obviously, like when you're traveling between those long plane rides or long car rides, are people at risk of getting a UTI if they aren't using the bathroom as much as they should be? I think what happens is that somebody is on a plane and they're not drinking as much. So the urine is more concentrated and that causes some irritation to the bladder. They're under maybe a little more stressful situation besides because of being in a travel scenario. I don't ever underestimate, you know, being in an unfamiliar surrounding and the stressful component of that. But you know, if you're on a two or three hour flight and you held your urine for that long, that does not cause a urinary tract infection. If you were somebody who only voided once a day and, uh, you know, 10 plus hours went in between each time you voided, usually that would be in the situation where somebody really is in retention and they're just not able to void, right? And so they're not able to circulate the urine through the bladder and out, going from the kidney to the bladder and out and keep that cycle moving because they're in retention. So that's a different scenario. But when I hear this, especially with sometimes kids and they say, you're not going to the bathroom enough, um, sometimes again, well-meaning providers encourage people to go every hour. Well, that's a little bit cumbersome, right? So. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. And we don't know that that really helps. Uh, I think the main thing is, is just trying to make sure you're getting the adequate fluids in. So your urine's a light yellow color. If that's the case, 
then a normal voiding pattern is voiding about every three to four hours during the day. And uh, that's how you keep things just cycling through and flushed. I think, you know, holding it a little bit because you're on a plane and you wanted to wait until you landed and use the toilet in the airport rather than on the plane, but it was only a two hour flight, that's not going to give you a UTI. Good to know. Thank you. So I want to switch gears a bit and now go into how we can make sure our urologic systems stay healthy this summer and while traveling. So I think you probably talked about this a little bit um, at the beginning of our conversation, but what are the benefits of sticking to a routine while traveling and what should that routine really include? Well, one of the things, um, besides the things I've already mentioned um, that we didn't get into too much detail is really bowel health. And so, of course, when we're out of our routines, um, there's a high incidence of constipation uh, in general. If somebody goes to a different country where you have to be careful about the foods you eat, as I said, maybe some diarrheal issues. But by and large, I think most of the time when somebody gets out of their routine, they get a little bit more on the constipated side. And especially if they're not exercising as vigorously as they usually do at home, because exercise is a big part of keeping your bowel regimen where it needs to be. So I think we know that when somebody is having bowel issues, especially constipation, that absolutely can affect your bladder issues. Somebody who is quite constipated, it does increase your risk of getting urinary tract infections because the bacterial load of the stool down in the rectum that's there for days because it's not coming out, that bacterial load increases and causes more colonization uh, down there and it increases the likelihood of getting a urinary tract infection. So besides uh, affecting how your bladder feels when you're very constipated, that can really put pressure on uh, the rest of the pelvic structures and also make the bladder feel a little more irritated. And it can exacerbate these overactive bladder symptoms. And then if it exacerbates this, I feel like I have to go all the time, it can also exacerbate the urgency incontinence component. And then if patients having more leakage. So staying with a good bowel regimen is really paramount to keeping a good bladder health as well. The other thing I would say is, um, besides the things I've already mentioned, making sure you're on your fluids, up on your fluids on a regular basis, uh, keeping your bowel regimen where it needs to be, making sure you're getting some regular aerobic exercise, even if it's just brisk walking. The other aspect is really being planful. Meaning, if you already have a bit of a problem, then the chance is that problem can get exacerbated when you're out of your normal routine and out of your normal element. So you want to sort of plan for that. Make sure that you have the supplies that you need just in case you have enough medication if your bladder issues are being managed with medications. Make sure to carry those on your, in your carry-on in case something happens, right, with your checked bags. Make sure if you are having to use some protective pads or protective garments that you have enough with you so that you're not caught off guard and, supply, and surprised. And then um, also if you are planning some great adventure out maybe in a very rural area, then you need to be sure to plan ahead for that as well and make sure you have what you need so you don't find yourself really um, you know, in an awkward situation. So being as planful as possible, I think can really help you enjoy your vacation um, without too much worry. You definitely, if you already know what kinds of things can exacerbate your bladder symptoms, then you wanna make sure that you're staying away from those things. Sometimes it can be um, alcohol, sometimes it can be certain kinds of foods or drinks, or sometimes it's just really stress, right? Again, anytime you're out of your element, even though you're enjoying your vacation, there's still always an element of stress. And we know that stress can affect your normal bladder function too. So trying to keep things um, nice and calm <laughs> and the stress to a minimum is also very helpful. Thank you so much for going into that detail. I think that's going to be really helpful. 
So you've touched on a lot of great information in this conversation. If you kind of had to sum it up, what is one piece of advice that you find is most important when it comes to keeping our urologic systems in check while traveling? I mean, I guess I would say as an overall, keeping your routine as normal as possible, right? When it comes to just regular health issues, as far as fluid and diet and exercise. But if I had to choose one thing out of those things, I would say two liters of fluid a day. Sometimes if somebody is a recurrent kidney stone former or really is a recurrent urinary tract infection person, we have some other tips that we recommend to try and keep those things at bay, maybe drinking a little bit more than the two liters, but on average, two liters a day spread out evenly throughout the day. And your urine, a light yellow color, that's the biggest advice I think. I can give to keep your urological system in check. Great. Thank you. Well, Dr. Sutherland, thank you so much for taking the time to be on today's episode of the Urology Care Podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. It's always a joy to participate with this with the Urology Care Foundation. This podcast has been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, the official foundation of the American Urological Association. For more information on today's topic, and for all things urology health, visit urologyhealth.org. That's urologyhealth.org.